Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll be discussing factorial notation, n choose r notation, converting between base 10 and base 2, and the idea of tracing an algorithm. This material is from section 5.1 of the book, and uh, the corresponding homework is homework 5.1b. Remember that there are two homework assignments from section 5.1. This is the second one. Let's start with factorial notation. Here's the book's definition of the factorial symbol, along with the author's remark. Uh, the factorial is defined for positive integers n by this common formula, n times n minus 1 all the way down to 3, 2, 1. And then for the number 0, 0 factorial is just simply defined to be the number 1. Now this amounts to what's called a piecewise definition. The formula for n factorial depends on uh, which part of the domain n is in. In other words, uh, n factorial is actually defined for all n, all integers n, greater than or equal to 0. And you use this formula when n is in that part of the domain, and you use this formula for the particular value n equals 0. Now this kind of definition is common, but it always leads to confusion. The fact that 0 factorial is 1 seems strange and arbitrary. Most people would expect that 0 factorial would be 0. The author doesn't say much except just to say that uh, in chapter 9, which is quite a ways in the future, uh, you'll see that this definition is convenient for many mathematical formulas. That's kind of vague, and it's not very comforting right now. I prefer a different definition of factorial. Here's mine. n factorial is defined for all integers n greater than or equal to 0 by this formula. You have a number 1 sitting here, and sitting next to it, n consecutive integers beginning with 1 and ending with n. So, for instance, to compute 4 factorial using this definition, it would look like this. To compute 3 factorial, and 2 factorial, and 1 factorial, and finally 0 factorial. So you see that when I computed 4 factorial, I had 4 consecutive integers sitting next to the 1. When I computed 3 factorial, I had 3 there. When I computed 1 factorial, I had 1 integer sitting next to the 1. When I compute 0 factorial, I don't have any integers. I have 0 integers next to the 1. So that's maybe a little bit better. You can see that uh, it, I don't have to have any special case for, for my definition for n equals 0. Um, it's just a... a um, the same formula that I use for all the other cases. But that still leaves uh, uh, an obvious question. That is, why, why have 0 factorial equals 1 when a more obvious definition would be to have 0 factorial equals 0? In other words, why use this definition or this definition, why do we want a formula where 0 factorial turns out to be the number 1? If everybody's expecting that 0 factorial would be 0, why not have a formula that gives us 0 factorial equaling 0? Well, the reason that factorial is defined the way it is um, has to do with the sequence of numbers that it produces. This sequence, 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, 1, 20, go back up and look at these numbers. 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, the next number up here would be 120. That's a sequence of numbers. That sequence of numbers occurs often in math. By contrast, this sequence with a 0 at the beginning does not often occur in math. So the factorial notation was, was introduced to correspond to the sequence of numbers that occurs often. In other words, 
we we see this sequence occur frequently, so we want to have a symbol for that sequence. There would be no reason to invent a symbol for this sequence because this sequence doesn't come up in math. In fact, it's possible to give a definition of the factorial, a different definition, that serves also as an example of a situation where this sequence occurs. So here's the definition. Uh, define n factorial for a non-negative integer n to be this, the nth derivative of x to the n. So let's use that definition. Uh, with that definition, 4 factorial would be computed this way. So we get the number 24 for 4 factorial. If I compute 3 factorial, we get the number 6. 2 factorial, 1 factorial, we get the answer 1. And for 0 factorial, we have the zeroth derivative of x to the zero. Well, the zeroth derivative means that you don't take the derivative at all. So you just have x to the zero, which is the number one. Now this process occurs in math. For instance, when finding the Taylor polynomial for a function, you do this exact sort of calculation to compute coefficients. So that's an instance where this sequence of numbers occurs in math. That's why the factorial symbol has the definition that it does. It was introduced to have a symbol for this frequently occurring sequence. So let's do some examples involving factorial notation. The trick in doing a lot of these computations is to show enough terms of the factorial expression that you can see some cancellation that's going to happen. So earlier, in the presentation of the factorial, the author shows the, the, the leftmost two terms and the rightmost three terms. But in this example, I uh, chose to show the leftmost four terms and only the rightmost two. The reason was, I knew that in the denominator, I would have terms that would cancel some of those terms up there if I went far enough up here in this expression. So you can see the cancellation that will happen. This 5 will cancel that 5, that 4 will cancel that 4, that 2 will cancel that 2. So we just end up with an answer of 42. Question B, 7 factorial over 0 factorial. The answer to that is 5,040. Question C is tricky because it contains a variable. Now we have to uh, make sure that this symbol is even defined. So remember, the factorial symbol is only defined for non-negative integers. So we have to be assured that the number m is greater than or equal to 0 so that the numerator will even exist. And in fact, we've got to, we've got to be ensured that number m is greater than or equal to 4 because m minus 4 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Well, there's a disclaimer. It says that in the expressions that involve variables, you can assume that the values of the variables are restricted so that the expressions are actually defined. Okay, so then how do we compute something like question C? Well, we do something similar to what we did in question A, but we just use letters. Now you can see that I'm starting the expansion of the symbol M factorial. How far do I need to go? I know that I need to go all the way down to 2 and 1 on the right, but how far do I need to go here? Well, realize that in the denominator, I'm going to have a similar expression happening starting with m minus 4. 
So I need to go at least that far in the numerator before I use the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. So there's the expression for m factorial in the numerator with a whole bunch of terms that might seem like uh, you know more terms than I need to describe m factorial. And they are more terms than I need. But I'm going to have something in the denominator that I want to cancel some terms. So there you see that I've got an m minus 4 in the numerator and denominator. They'll cancel. I have an m minus 5. All these other terms will cancel all the way down to the 2. So I end up with the result m times the quantity m minus 1 times the quantity m minus 2 times the quantity m minus 3. Let's go on. Question D. m factorial divided by m minus p plus 2 factorial. Well, I'm going to start this by working on the denominator. So the denominator is m minus p plus 2 factorial. It's going to start with this term, m minus p plus 2, and go down from there, all the way down to 2 and to 1. Now in the numerator, we're going to need some terms that are going to cancel that. So we know it's going to be the same kind of thing that has happened in the previous problems. So let's go ahead and put those terms in that are going to cancel and then build the rest of the terms that we need to get m factorial in the numerator. So m factorial is going to have to end with these terms. They're all going to cancel the ones in the denominator. That's going to be really nice. But what else is going to be in the numerator? Well, the m factorial is going to contain a bunch of terms up here that go all the way up to m. So it's going to start with these two, and then it's going to go down. Now we should show one term before we get to these terms that are going to be canceling. Well, what's the term that precedes this term? Here I have a plus 1. Here I have a plus 2. The next term is going to have a plus 3. So there's my sequence of terms for m factorial with a bunch of terms in the middle that have been revealed, or as I said in the last video, they've been unhid. They're hidden in the original presentation of m factorial. m factorial would be presented most economically this way, with a bunch of terms in the middle hidden. And so all of these red terms here are, are hidden in that ellipsis, in that dot 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 notation. They're revealed, they're unhidden here, because it's going to be convenient to have them there to cancel some of the terms in the denominator. All right, so now let's do the cancellation. Oops, I got rid of a pair of parentheses I didn't mean to get rid of. So this term is going to cancel this term. This term is going to cancel this term, all the way down to the twos canceling. So the result is this product. Let's go on. Now I want to talk about what's called n choose r. This symbol, n above r in a pair of parentheses, that's not a fraction, it's n sitting above r. Other symbols are this, little n, capital C, little r, or capital C parentheses, little n, little r, or capital C subscript, n comma r. It's spoken n choose r. It's also spoken n take r. Now the usage of this symbol, that is uh, the, the things that you're allowed to put in this symbol, are integers n and r that satisfy this. 0 is less than or equal to r, which is less than or equal to n. So notice that tells us that both 0 and n have to be integers that are greater than or equal to 0. There's no way for this equation or this inequality to be true otherwise. And what's the meaning of this symbol? Well, it means this, this calculation. Now, why would you be doing that calculation? 
Well, one interpretation of this symbol is it's the number of subsets with R elements that can be chosen from a set that has N elements. That's why it's called N choose R. That's one use of this symbol. But it comes up in lots of other places in math as well. That's why this symbol gets introduced. It gets introduced because this calculation happens to occur frequently in math. Let's do some examples. These are similar to some examples from the book. Example A, 7 choose 4. What does that mean? Well, let's go back up and remind ourselves the definition. N choose R means this, N factorial over R factorial and minus R factorial. So 7 choose 4 would have a 7 up here and a 4 here and a 7 minus 4 here. So when I build the expressions for 7 factorial, 4 factorial, and 3 factorial, look, I get a bunch of terms that cancel. All of these terms cancel all of these terms. And hey, look, I get a bunch of other stuff that cancels as well. This 3 times 2 times 1 cancels that 6. So I end up with 7 times 5, which is just 35. Let's go on to question B. 7 choose 7. Well, let's go back up and look at our formula. N choose R means this. So 7 choose 7 is going to have a 7 here, and a 7 here, and a 7 minus 7 there. So we just get the number 1, because remember that 0 factorial is the number 1. Question C. 7 choose 0. Well, 7 choose 0 is also 1. Same idea. Finally, question D. m plus 2 choose m minus 3. Now here we have to have the same disclaimer. These expressions that involve variables, uh, you have to be assured that the values of the variables are restricted so that the expressions are actually defined. Well, this symbol means that we have to build the expression for n choose r populating it with these terms. So look, in the denominator, this m cancels that m, so I just end up with a 5 factorial in the bottom, in the right side of the bottom. Well, let's continue. So notice what I, what I did in the numerator. I carried the expression for m plus 2 factorial long enough that I got a bunch of terms here that are going to cancel terms that I knew were going to show up in the denominator. So all these terms here are going to cancel all these terms here. And then what am I left with? I'm left with that expression. These factors multiplied together survived the canceling in the numerator. In the denominator, we have all these constants. That's 5 factorial. That's the number 120. So it looks like we end up with a fraction. But it turns out that there are going to be numbers that cancel. So we, we are not actually looking at, uh, if you choose any value of m, and you put it into this expression, this is going to simplify to become an integer. Why should you believe that? Well, one thing to notice is that, look, in the numerator, I have five consecutive integers. The lowest one is m minus 2. The next one is m minus 1. They go all the way up to m plus 2. Five consecutive integers. Well one of those is going to be divisible by 5. Anytime you have 5 numbers in a row, like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, that's 5 numbers in a row, 
one of those was divisible by 5. The number 10 was in that sequence, and it's divis divisible by 5. So exactly one of those green numbers is going to cancel that 5 in the denominator. Now look, what else? Uh, I've got five numbers in a row. Um, one of them is going to be divisible by 2. In fact, a couple of them are. So you can see that um, I'm going to have something that will cancel the uh, a couple of factors of 2. Well, it's not hard to figure out that we'll actually cancel both of these factors of 2. And again, I have five numbers in a row. One of them is going to be divisible by 3. So there's going to be a number in the numerator that's going to cancel that 3. So what we're looking at here is an integer, actually. If we substitute any value for n into that expression, we're going to get an integer. Why am I making such a big deal of that? Well, go back up to n choose r. One interpretation of n choose r is it comes up when you're counting the number of subsets that can be chosen from a set with n elements. When you're counting things, there's going to be an integer number of them. So the number that you get as a result better be an integer. OK, let's go on. Now I want to talk about base notation. This symbol, where the letter b stands for an integer that's greater than or equal to 2, the letter k stands for an integer that's greater than or equal to 0, and then each of these symbols here are integers and each one of them satisfies the inequality that they have to be greater than or equal to 0 and less than b, whatever b is. So that's a symbol, a bunch of, a bunch of things that represent integers sitting side by side in parentheses with the subscript outside the parentheses, subscript b. What does it mean? Well, it means this this number. You multiply r subscript k times b to the kth power. You multiply r subscript k minus 1 times b to the k minus 1 power. All the way down to r subscript 1 times b to the 1. And r subscript 0 times b to the 0. Well, b to the 0 is just the number 1, so you just end up with r subscript 0. You build all those terms and you, you add them all up. You add them all together. That's what this symbol means. It means this big mess. So consider the symbol 105. If that symbol represents a base 10 number, then what that symbol means is this. That symbol 105 represents this. 1 times 10 squared plus 0 times 10 to the first plus 5 times 10 to the 0. Using base notation, we would write this. Let's go on. If we consider the symbol 105 as representing a base 7 number, though, then that symbol stands for a different number. Now, we can convert that number to a base 10 representation. That symbol, 105 parentheses with a subscript 7, means this number, 54. So if you have any ambiguity about the base, then you better not write symbols like this without having um, an indication of what base you're talking about. This symbol means the number 54. This symbol means the number 105. Question C. Convert this number, which is presented in base 2, to a base 10 representation. All right, well, let's just use our prescription. Let's do this. Build that sum of powers. This is a sum of powers of B, powers of the base. So there I built my sum of powers of 2. 
Notice that we know that the rightmost power has to be zero, and we just go up from there. So I looked at this, and I thought to myself, if I start with zero, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. I knew I was going to have to have five powers. So that's how I knew to start with one times two to the fifth. All right, well, let's go on. So this number, 101, 101, base 2, is equal to this number, 45, base 10. As you can see, uh, converting some number from a, a different representation into base 10 is easy. The reverse process is, is more tedious. That is, if you're given a number that's expressed in base 10 notation, how can you find coefficients that would express the same number in some other base, for instance, base 2 notation? Well, the process is described in the book on page 272 and 273. Essentially, you set up a sequence of equations of this form, m equals 2q plus r, where r satisfies this inequality. 0 is less than or equal to r, which is less than 2. That is, r has to be 0 or r has to be 1. Now, I call this a QRT equation, quotient remainder theorem equation. Remember, that's the kind of equation that came up a couple of videos ago when we were talking about the quotient remainder theorem. Special equations of that form where the number r satisfies that inequality. The starting equation is set up by letting m, the thing that's sitting over here, just be the number n that you're trying to convert. Remember, we're trying to express a number n that's given in base 10 notation trying to express that in base 2 notation. So we start with some number n. So we're going to build a bunch of equations of this form. The first equation, you use m equals n. So you find the q and the r that work. That is, you find um, the symbols that work in this equation, where r satisfies 0 less than or equal to r less than 2. That is. So the very first time you set up one of these equations, you have an n on the left side, and the q and the r that you get that work get given the names q subscript 0 and r subscript 0. That's what I would call the zeroth equation. And then you take that q subscript 0 and you put it over on the left side, and you build a new qrt equation. And this one is called the first equation. And in this equation, you build a QRT equation that works with the number Q0 sitting there, and of course the, the number 2 is sitting there. You're stuck with that, and you find the values of R of Q and R that work to build a, a, an equation this time around, and you make note of those. So the, con the procedure continues until you reach an equation where the q that you get is a 0. So you end up with a whole list of these equations. Each of these is a QRT equation, starting with the very first one that had your number n, and going all the way until you get to one that has a 0 there. Now, notice that there's a q0 there, and there's a q0 there. I could substitute all of this stuff into that equation. Let's back up a bit. This equation has a q subscript k minus 1. I could substitute this equation into the previous equation, substitute th that equation into the previous equation, and so on. If I do that with all those equations, I get, an, and simplify, I get an equation of that form. Oh, well that's one of those equations of the form that, that turned up in that description of base notation. It's an equation that's sums of powers of the base. So if I have this equation that says that my number n can be written in this way as sums of, the, of powers of 2, that tells us that these coefficients That equation tells us that all these coefficients could be used 
to build the base 2 representation of the number n. So, so the idea is you build this collection of QRT equations and you, you look at these remainders and realize those remainders can be used to build two things. They can be used to build this equation that's showing that n can be written as a sum of powers of 2. Those coefficients can be used to build this, the, uh, the base 2 representation of the number n. The book presents a method of doing uh, the conversion from base 10 to base 2 by doing repeated divisions by 2. And they show a concise way of, of doing the repeated divisions without taking up much space by leaving out a bunch of symbols. Now, that sort of shorthand way of, of writing things is, is kind of cool. It's, it's the way that, uh, similar to the way that we all learned how to do something called synthetic division in whatever that was, junior high or high school. The problem is that that's, uh, that mean, the meaning of those concise symbols is very easy to forget. I mean, I think I remembered how to do uh, synthetic division for about a day after I did it the last time. I mean, it's just not the kind of thing that you can remember. So you get this very concise presentation, but then you, you can't remember what any of this stuff means. And also, you know, if you want to think about presenting a calculation to someone else, then a calculation that is so concise that it leaves out most of the symbols, uh, it's not a very good presentation for explaining something to someone else. So that's why I prefer to do base conversions as I described in the previous pages. Uh, I don't find it helpful to use division by two, even. I, I just find the Q and the R that work in those equations. That sounds vague. I'll do an example and you'll see what I mean. But here's my general method. If I want to convert a number n that's in base 10 notation to a base 2 notation, I start by building that list of QRT equations, and then I write the equation that expresses n as a sum of powers of 2, and then I uh, express that equation using base notation. So example 4 is similar to 5.1 number 83 has two parts. The first part says write an equation that expresses 109 as a sum of powers of 2. Question B says convert 109 from base 10 to base 2. Actually, question B is like the question that's asked in the book in 5.1 number 83. But the idea of me asking the question this way is that questions A and B are like the second and third steps in my method. That is like what we're being asked to do in question A, and this is like what's being asked in question B in my question. The book just asks you to do this, uh, convert from base 10 to base 2. So I want to ask both these questions, and the reason is I want to do this list of three things. I want to build the list of QRT equations, and then I want to answer my question A, and then I want to answer my question B. So in our problem, we can think of this 109 as the starting n. So let's build the, the QRT equations. Now, in the QRT equations, we're always going to have d equals 2. And our starting QRT equation has an n. That's the number 109. So we started with n equal 109. That's the number we were given. That goes up here as the very first value of n. And in each equation, we ended up with a q and an r that worked. And we kept going until here, 
when we reach an equation that has a q that's zero, then we know that we're done. And notice that in each subsequent equation, the number that had been the q in the previous equation becomes the n for the next equation. Now we make a, a list of these remainders. We name them. That number one is the remainder r subscript zero. That's the, uh, the, the zeroth equation. That number zero is r subscript one. This last equation is the, the sixth equation. So actually there are seven equations starting with the zeroth one and ending with the sixth one. So there is our collection of, of a bunch of QRT equations of the, of the type described in my method here and described up here as well. Now it's this collection of equations that the book, uh, well they write once, but then they say from then on you should use, you might consider using their nifty way of, of doing these calculations where you leave out a bunch of symbols and it takes up less space on the page. But I find when I look at that stuff, I think, well, what does this mean? You know, you might remember what it means briefly, but, um, but then you forget soon after, and nobody else is going to know what it means. Whereas these equations that I've circled, they make sense as equations. You can understand what each, each one of those equations means. Now let's use these equations to build this, an equation that expresses 109 as a sum of powers of 2. Well, we're going to use these as the coefficients. That's going to be the coefficient for 2 to the 6th. That's going to be the coefficient for 2 to the 5th. That's going to be the coefficient for 2 to the 1st, and so on. So there you see my, my powers of 2 with those coefficients. And I went ahead and included the ones that have a 0 coefficient, because it, it helps us make sense of, of what we did up here. What are these equations telling us? We can just slavishly build the whole equation. Now that tells us that we can convert the number 109 easily into a binary representation using all of these things as the coefficients, all of them. So you see that it's helpful to have this, this presentation of this equation where you have all of the terms there, even the ones that have a zero coefficient, because we're just going to drag those coefficients down and put them into this expression here. All those coefficients were there, all the ones that were 1 and also the ones that were 0, and they just get collected and put into this expression. So again, this question that I ask is more than is asked in the book. The book just says convert from base 10 to base 2. But I, I find it uh, important for myself to, to be clear in my calculations so I understand what I'm doing and so that I can show someone else the results. You show someone else this and tell them what it means is this. Uh, that makes sense. Now, uh, on pages 272 and 273, the author presents a decimal to binary conversion algorithm. And uh, it's, it's uh, kind of dense writing, but it's describing the same idea that we can write a number a as a sum of coefficients times powers of 2. Coefficients times powers of 2. The coefficients, though, look like this, r bracket k instead of r subscript k. The author writes about how in computer programming that's a common way to write the terms of a, of a sequence. Um, and that those coefficients can be used to build a binary presentation of your number, a binary representation. Well, the algorithm that the authors present is this algorithm here. So you um, do these computations to compute 
these values of Q and these values of R subscript or R bracket I. So you have a number of symbols involved in this in this algorithm. You have the most important symbol is the input A, which is the number that you want to convert. And um, the symbols that are used in the algorithm are this letter I, which is going to keep track of which step we're on, uh, how many times we've gone through some repetitive process. There's going to be a letter Q that's going to be used to store the values of some integers. It's going to start out in the beginning that Q is going to be given the value of A. So this symbol means give Q the value of A. And then there's going to be symbols like this, R bracket I. That's uh, those, again, those symbols that denote the, the remainders that are going to show up as the coefficients when we build our base 2 representation. So this algorithm, the procedure, shows how to get these coefficients. You start, again, by having i be the number 0 and having the q be the number of a, whatever you started with. And then, and then you compute a coefficient. You compute this r sub uh, r bracket i. Well, in the beginning, that's going to be r bracket zero, and that's going to be q mod two. Well, that means that um, that's going to be the remainder in an equation that looks like this. So. An, a QRT equation where the thing on the left is our starting number and we have a, a D of 2 and then we find whatever Q and R work to make that equation be a valid QRT equation. Well hey that's like that's like this. We, we started by putting our number that we were given, our 109 on the left and we put a 2 there, and then we found a Q and an R that worked. And then we um, and then we went from there, building these subsequent QRT equations. Well, that's what's going on in this, in this algorithm. You find a, a Q that works, and you find an R that works. The R you're going to keep uh, and store that as one of your coefficients, one of your remainders that's going to be useful later. And then you go around again. That is, um, you you go to the next value of i. You let i be i plus 1, and so on. So this process is entirely analogous to the process that, um, that I did uh, on the previous page. And it's analogous to the books process that is described using that very uh, terse notation. Now, um, this in terms of converting decimal to binary is way overkill. Um, again, I like my way because I can make sense of it and I can remember how it works. Um, and it, it, doing it kind of reminds me of what things mean. But this exercise of, of understanding this algorithm is useful because later in the book we're going to be wanting to scrutinize algorithms and, and um, assess how they behave and how much computing time they use. So for that reason, it's useful to spend some time trying to figure out notation like this and figure out how you keep track of how something like this behaves. So I've assigned you a problem that has to do with using this algorithm to do a decimal to binary conversion and uh, doing what's called tracing the operation of the algorithm. So I'm going to do an example like that here. This is similar to 5.1 number 86. We want to make a table to trace the action of that algorithm uh, to convert the number 109 from decimal to binary. Now, realize that we have done this conversion already. We know what's going to happen when you convert 109 from decimal to binary. You're going to get this result. And furthermore, we know how that result was obtained. The result was obtained by a bunch of these QRT equations that yielded these remainders, which went into this binary representation. 
So we have done all the work. So this uh, trace table is just going to be a different way of displaying the results that we that we already got. So the iteration, this is the um, the value of i is is referring to this iteration. How many times have you gone through the process? The zeroth time through the process, that is the very beginning when you haven't done the process yet, the value of a is the number 109. Remember in that algorithm, a is the number that you want to convert to binary. So at the very beginning, we know that that's what a is. And at the beginning, the value of i gets set to the number 0. Remember at the beginning, i gets set to 0. Now what about these other cells? Well, the thing is we haven't done the process yet. So uh, we don't have any values in these cells yet. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the process described in the algorithm. That is, we're going to do this once. So after we do this, what's going to be the status of things? Well, let's zoom in on this. After we do those circled steps, R is going to have a value, Q is going to have a value, and I is going to have gotten moved up one notch. Instead of I equals 0, it's going to be I equals 1. Now what are these values, Q and R? Well, they're the values from that QRT equation. So at the end of the, uh, the first time through this process, I will have gotten incremented to be the number 1. And then what's going to go here are the numbers that we got in the very first QRT equation. In this first equation, we had Q equals 54 and R equals 1. That is, this equation says 109 equals 2 times 54 plus 1. So that's our Q and that's our R that we're going to put in our trace table. And it's R with a subscript 0. So our black number 54 goes in that cell for the Q and the red number 1 that was the remainder goes in this cell for the R subscript 0. Okay, now we go around again. Our second iteration, our second time through the process, well, let's go back up and look. After we go through this process a second time, what's going to be the status of things? Well, i is going to have gotten incremented again. So if i at the beginning was, was 0, and the first time through this process it got incremented to 1, the second time through the process it gets incremented to 2. And what about the other things? Well, q gets given a new value, and we generate a new r, a r, a r bracket i, so r bracket 1. And what are those numbers that, that are going to be um, that are going to be created. Well, there are the Q and the R that worked in that next equation. So R bracket 1, or R subscript 1, is going to be the number 0, and the value of Q is that black number 27. So Q is going to be 27, and R bracket 1 is going to be the red number 0. Let's go on. Uh, the third iteration, that is the third time through the process, at the beginning of that um, process, I has the value 2. And at the end of the process, I is going to get changed. But at the beginning of the process, I will have the value 2. So let's go up and look at the process. So at the beginning of this process, when i has the value 2, so at the beginning of this process, i has the value 2, so we're going to be creating r bracket 2 
by doing this calculation. And we're going to be creating a new value of q by doing this calculation. In other words, we need to go up and look at our equation list. That's the equation that's being talked about the, uh, the third time through the process. So the, the third iteration, i is going to get changed from, one, uh, from 2 to 3. And in that process, we create our subscript 2, and we create this q equals 13. So our subscript 2 is going to be set at the number 1, and the value of q is going to be changed to 13. So now you see the, the idea that we are going to just be populating this row of Q cells with that list of Q values that we had in those equations. 54, 27, 13, 6, 3, 1, 0. That's a list of Q values that we'll put in those cells. 54, 27, 13, 6, 3, 1, 0. And look what's happening in these cells. We're just taking those remainders that we found and we're putting them in those cells. So this list of remainders goes into those cells, that diagonal list of cells. So there's what's called a trace table. So again, it reflects the idea that when you have not gone through the process at all, this is the status of all of your letters. A has a value, I has a value, Q and R don't have a value. After you go through the process once, then I has been given a value of 1, and Q has been given a value of 54, and a value has been created for R0, it's this number 1. After you go through the process a second time, then I is going to have gotten changed to the number 2, and Q has going to be changed to the number 27, and this value has been created for the number R. So this trace table, uh, again, is uh, a, a, a kind of a cumbersome way to, to, um, to present what we already presented here. Of course, this may seem like a cumbersome way to present what, um, what the book does much more concisely, but I like this presentation because it, it makes sense to me and, and other people can read it. But this trace table idea, we're going to revisit later in the course when we, when we study algorithms. So I wanted you to have some experience reading algorithms and working on trace tables. Oh, and it looks like I forgot to complete the cells of this row. So there's our trace table. So like I said, you have a similar homework problem where you'll have to scrutinize that, um, that algorithm and, and use it to populate this table. My recommendation is that you do what I did. That is, you think about this list of QRT equations. Build this list, and then you've got the numbers that you need to populate your table. You have your list of Q values, and you have your list of R values that you can use to populate that table. Well, that's the end of the video. Thanks very much.